Hi class, this is the last video read aloud for Wish Tree, so I decided to dress up into my suit and tie um, to send off Wish Tree one last time. So I hope you in, have enjoyed the book so far, and we're going to finish it right now and read chapters 49, 50, and 51 and see how it ends for Red in Wish Tree. All right, let's get going. I'm on page 197, chapter 49. We just left off with the neighborhood combining, coming together to send Red off. They had the big saw. They were ready to cut him down. Francesca's reading Maeve's old journal that Samar and Steven gave her. And we just like found out that Steven set up this cool wish tree index card chain that told Samar to stay, meaning her and her family to stay, not leave, which is really cool. So a good day for uh, Red. All right, let's see how the book ends. Dave had a megaphone, and through it he reminded the crowd to stay behind the barriers that had been erected. This is a big tree, folks, he said, and when it goes, we don't want anyone else going with it. Bongo, I said in a voice that she could only hear. You need to get to a safe place. You heard him. I'm a big tree. You don't want to be in the way when I fall. I'm not going anywhere, she replied in a stubborn whisper. But don't worry about me. I'll be fine. But I'm staying with you, Red, and that's final. Dave turned to his workers. Okay, let's get this show on the road. Please, Bongo, I said, softly but urgently. The saw moved closer. I waited, expecting to hear the painful roar of the chainsaw engine. Instead, a small but intense sound filled the air. Something like a puppy growl mixed with a kitten hiss. It was a baby opossum, darting through the huge crowd, across the muddy lawn, past Dave and his crew, around the massive saw, beneath the stump grinder, and finally, triumphantly, up my trunk, was none other than Flashlight. He climbed straight to his former hollow and settled there. And there's Flashlight trying to save the day his tiny head poking out. He was panting and trembling and hiccuping, but he did not seem to be in any danger whatsoever of fainting. We missed you, Red, he said in a voice so small that only Bongo and I could hear it. Hold off on the saw, Davy yelled. Some dang animal just ran up the trunk. Bongo popped out of her hollow. Flash, she hissed. You can't be here, it's dangerous. They're about to, you know. You're here, Flash pointed out. Across the grass streaked Harry Spiders, with her other babies trailing, she went straight to the opossum's hollow where she proceeded to scold Flash as she snuggled him close. In the sky, little Harold suddenly appeared, frantically flapping his wings like a fuzzy butterfly. Agnes and the rest of her brood followed. They settled into their old home as, they never, as if they'd never left. Bongo moved a home plate to make room for the owls. The ewes came next, trotting across the lawn. Last to join the group was the skunk family, who quickly scrambled up my trunk. Seven opossums, four raccoons, five owls, and six skunks had waddled, scooted, dashed, and fluttered from their various homes just to see me off. My residents, my friends. The crowd was delighted. People applauded. They cheered. They laughed. Francesca, straining to get a look, accidentally let go of the kitten's leashes, allowing Lewis and Clark to escape. They ran straight to me, clamoring at my trunk to join the gang. It wasn't all perfection. The babies and parents were grumbling, but softly enough that none sorry, but softly enough that none of the humans could hear. Ouch, muttered hot buttered popcorn. Your tail is in my mouth, cried one of the ewes. You smell like a skunk, someone complained. I am a skunk, came the reply. Mom, asked Harold, should I be afraid of a cat? As a rule, yes, said Agnes, but this is a special circumstance. It took some effort, but eventually the entire group settled in together up their highest wishes, above the highest wishes. They gazed down calmly at the fascinated crowd. One of the tree cutters took off his helmet and scratched his head. This just don't happen, he said to Dave. Those animals ought to be eating each other. It's some kind of crazy critter miracle, said another worker. He pulled out his smartphone. Smartphone. This is going on Facebook. Lots of other people seemed to have the same idea. Cameras clicked away. Ignoring the barricades, the reporters dashed over. Microphones extended as if they were hoping to interview the animals. Bongo's, uh, Bongo, always a bit of a ham, was happy to comply. Chip, please, she said in the microphone waiting beneath her. Oh, man, this is so cool. Check this out. 
So you can see the whole critter family that came together, all together, to basically say, we're not leaving red. Don't cut them down. We're staying. Dave gestured helplessly at Francesca. What is up with this, lady? How are we supposed to cut this tree down? Francesca, wiping away tears, stood. She put her arms around Stephen and Samar. Slowly, they made their way across the muddy grass. Why is she crying? When she reached me, she pulled a bookmark from Maeve's journal before handing the book to Stephen. It was a strip of cloth made of blue striped fabric, frayed and faded. Maeve's wish. Carefully, Francesca tied it to my lowest branch, already crowded with wishes. She stared long and hard at the animals. Lewis and Clark purred happily. The crowd quieted. The only sound was the rustling of my leaves. Finally, Francesca spoke. Look, I don't do speeches. That's not my way. She patted my trunk. But here's the thing. Until today, I almost forgot how important this old tree is to my family story. And from the look of it, she pointed to the residents, it's important to a few other families as well. Many people smiled. A few laughed. I hate this word, Francesca continued, running her hand over the card bar. Hate it. My great-great-grandmother -grand great -great Maeve would have hated it just as much. Here in this neighborhood, we're better than this. She looked it over at Samar's parents. We don't threaten people here. We welcome them. Francesca reached for Samar's hand. This tree is staying put, and I hope your family will too. There's the tree. That's a good looking tree. You can kind of see it in the cover. That's more close up. And then far away you can see it. So go Francesca, right? Saving the day. That night, many hours after the crowd had scattered, Samar slipped out the front door of the little blue house. Stephen, who'd been watching from his bedroom window, joined her moments later. They sat silent beneath my wish-laden bows. The slightest breath of wind set, sent the index cards fluttering like huge moths. Moonlight was everywhere, it seemed, on the wishes, on my branches, on the downy-headed outlets and the upturned great gazes of Stephen and Samar. How beautiful we all were bathed by the soft and silver light. Do you think your family will stay here, Stephen asked, about after everything that's happened? I don't know, said Samar. I hope so. The breeze kicked up. Cards chattered. Ribbons danced. A scrap of notebook paper loosely tied with red yarn and my lowest branch broken free. Samar snatched it as it swooped past. She squinted at the scribbled writing. Then she stood, carefully trying, tying the paper back onto my branch. What was the wish for, Stephen asked. An invisible robot that does homework. <laughs> Seems unlikely. True, Samar leaned against my trunk and smiled. But then, so does a talking tree. Last chapter. If this were a fairy tale, I'd tell you there was something magical about that wishing day. That the world changed and we all lived happily ever after. But this is real life. In real life, like a good garden, is messy. Some things have changed, some things haven't. Still, optimist that I am, I'm feeling hopeful about the future. That whole, like, chapter 51 at the beginning, this is like everything that's happening in the world right now. That's pretty cool. I might have to share that. Samar's parents decided not to move, at least not for a while. Steven and Samar have become good friends. Sometimes they do their homework at the base of my trunk. Their parents still don't talk to one another. I'm not sure if they ever will. The police never found the boy who carved leave into my trunk. But a couple of weeks ago, I saw him sauntering by. I pointed him out to Bongo. Let's just say she made a very large deposit that day. All my residents are back where they belong, safe in my hollows. They still argue sometimes, but they haven't yet eaten one another. Francesca applied to the city to make, a, make me a heritage tree. That means I'm protected forever. She's also on a first-name basis with the local plumber, who's learning to deal with my pushy roots. Lewis and Clark still haven't figured out how to walk on leashes. Bongo made a new friend. His name is Harley Davidson. I suspect we may have some crow newbies in our future. Aww. As for me, I promised Bongo I, would, I will never be a Batinsky again. I told her that my meddling days are over, and yet there we are, you and I. What can I say? I'm more talkative than most trees. Still, if you find yourself standing near a particularly friendly-looking tree on a particularly lucky-feeling day, it can't hurt to listen. 
to the hurt to listen up. Trees can't tell jokes, but we can certainly tell stories. How cool is that book? And it ends with a little picture of a wish on one of his branches. Very, very cool. Um, I'm going to bookmark that beginning of page 51. That's it for Wish Tree, guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And once I get my next book, um, I'll do it some more. So, um, gotta love Wish Tree. I think Catherine Applegate is my favorite author to read. And I'll see you next time.